Good morning. My name is Dr. David Oyang from Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. I'm here with Dr. Bill Abraham from Ohio State University. Dr. Abraham, it's really great to chat with you and we just finished our session. Um, I'll lead off with a question. I know that you've done a lot of the pitiful work in this space with ambulatory kind of monitoring of heart failure. You're an investigator for Compass HF. You were the lead investigator for Champion for the CardioMEMS system. Tell us a little bit about the technology here and how do you compare and contrast this with the invasive devices? Yeah, well, you know, the first message is we need new and better technologies to monitor our heart failure patients because what we're doing today, our standard of care monitoring of patient symptoms and changes in daily weights isn't helping us keep many patients out of the hospital. So certainly I'm big on uh, some of the invasive or implantable technologies such as the CardioMEMS heart failure system. Uh, because it is absolute and actionable and it's been shown to help us keep patients out of the hospital. But we also need some non-invasive alternatives as well. And this is where I think the current technology could really play a substantial role. Uh, the technology uh, involves a smartphone-based application and then a, a speech processing system that creates uh, a detection engine which looks at or you know, attempts to predict, detect, or predict future heart failure events mm -hmm. uh, using both traditional forms of uh, statistical-based learning as well as machine learning uh, to get there. And uh, so I think uh, it's, a, it's an exciting field. Yeah, no, it's a really exciting area. Uh, I think two questions that lead off from that, one of which is uh, you mentioned the inclusion criteria was both for HEFPATH and HEFRAF, and it seems like it's a similar indication for a lot of the invasive systems. Given they're so different diseases, do you, is there a difference in effect, difference in outcome, or difference in how you think about using these ambulatory monitoring in these patient populations? Yeah, well, I think there's heterogeneity across the spectrum of heart failure by LVEF. The one thing that heart failure shares in common uh, across the population, regardless of LVEF, uh, is congestion, mm -hmm. elevated left atrial pressure, pulmonary congestion, fluid retention, et cetera. Yeah. I don't think it discriminates much between HEFPEF and HEFREF. So that's why monitoring technologies, and again, I'll reference CardioMEMS, uh, has been shown to be effective regardless of LV ejection fraction. And I think here as well, this speech technology, this speech processing technology also seems to perform equally well regardless of left ventricular ejection fraction with that common denominator being uh, fluid retention and pulmonary congestion. Yeah, and one of the audience questions was, you know, given there are a variety of respiratory illnesses, kind of pneumonia, COPD exacerbation, that even for us clinicians, sometimes it's challenging. How do you distinguish or how uh, kind of, if there is con con concomitant disease, how, how should we think about these systems? Yeah, so the good news is that these systems develop a patient-specific baseline. So it sort of takes into account the baseline comorbidities, right? But of course, exacerbation of baseline comorbidities could be confounders here. And so the system has to try to discriminate those. And the way that was developed in this study was through, in the development group, the training group, through a look back. Mm -hmm. So, you know, patients, heart failure patients had heart failure events. And then we looked back to see what features of speech really, you know, discriminated worsening heart failure mm -hmm. from other types of events like respiratory infections or COPD exacerbations. Now we're still, you know, learning. Uh, here and uh, you know we need bigger numbers, bigger numbers of patients, bigger numbers of events uh, to fine tune mm -hmm. the system for sure. Uh, as you saw in the presentation, there are about two and a half or three false positive notifications per year. Mm -hmm. Are those heart failure events that didn't reach the threshold of hospitalization or the need for outpatient IV therapies? Uh, or are those other events such as respiratory events? And we've got to learn more about that. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about the signals that go into the system. You've mentioned it was language ag agnostic, and I think from the uh, population, they speak a variety of languages. What kind of things should people be thinking about as signals for pulmonary congestion? Yeah, so in this study, uh, there was a population that uh, across the population spoke four languages, English, Russian, uh, Arabic, and, and, and uh, Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're now uh, performing a study in the U.S. So we've got an ongoing study, FDA study in the U.S., uh, which will broaden that population as well, uh, a diverse population of, of uh, heart failure patients in the U.S. 
So we hope to have adequate numbers of Spanish speakers and other speakers, and of course the various accents and dialects uh, around the U.S. as well. Uh, but I think the key here is that the the system develops a a baseline profile uh, of stability of stable heart failure for each individual patient. Yeah. So it should be language independent uh, because what it's looking at is changes in speech pattern uh, from that patient specific baseline, you know, over, t over time. Yeah. Now it looks at a variety of things, uh, you know, pitch, tone, speech dynamics, and so on and so forth. There are lots of data points that go in here. You know, each one of these five sentences de uh, generates 20 data points, 20 speech features, mm -hmm. five sentences, that's 100 uh, speech features per day. Yeah. Spread that over a year's time, you're looking at tens of thousands of of, uh, of data points going into this algorithm uh, in, in each, each individual patient. Got it, got it. And I, I have to ask, you know, one question I, that came up for me was, there's such early detection of these sentinel events. Yeah. And oftentimes, even when I'm asking patients, I'm like, did you have any dietary discretion yesterday or even a week ago? Is it, are we seeing a lot that we're seeing just the tip of the iceberg and there's so much more that's happening beforehand? Or how do you think of, how is the algorithm able to detect something so early? Yeah, I think one of the things we've learned through our experience now almost 30 years with implantable hemodynamic monitors is that what we call acute decompensated heart failure is not so acute. Mm -hmm. uh, it really develops over a long period of time, many days or even many weeks, as patients retain a little bit of fluid each day. Yeah. And then, you know, what's acute about it is the worsening of symptoms. Mm -hmm. You know, usually within a couple or a few days of a hospitalization, the patient then begins to recognize worsening of their symptoms. But we've seen that pressures increase along with fluid, uh, you know, as early as a couple or three weeks, uh, maybe even in some patients uh, longer yeah. uh, before the actual event occurs. Yeah. And I think similar to that question, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you think about this kind of device in the setting of evolving medical therapy. I'm not sure if, and potentially this is in the future, but is it better for patients that have a daily diuretic requirement or patients who don't need a daily diuretic or patients on good GDMT or bad GDMT? How do you think of who are the patients that would benefit? Yeah, well, look, uh, you know, my hope always is that patients are well treated with GDMT at baseline. Although we know that in the community, based on uh, lots of reasons, uh, non-adherence, intolerance, uh, you know, unaffordability of some medicines and so on and so forth. That's not always the case. Uh, but regardless, since the major intervention here is treatment of congestion, mm -hmm. uh, and that is primarily through diuretic therapy, you know, I would expect that this will work uh, regardless of the background GDMT, mm -hmm. perhaps better on optimized GDMT, mm -hmm but should work regardless of uh, uh, b background uh, GDMT. And I think uh, the, the primary intervention will be diuretic therapy uh, in order to avert a heart yeah. failure hospitalization. Yeah. And, you know, potentially a, a broader question uh, that may be not directly related to this. I know that for, for cardio MEMS and invasive therapies, they really required a for invasive therapies are really required a randomized prospective trial. Obviously the FDA guidelines are not the same for software and I would definitely say that this is minimal risk, but how is the company and how are you thinking about what's the next stage of evidence or what other things you guys wanna do next? Yeah, absolutely. So I think we need to build a pyramid of evidence here because we really do wanna demonstrate not only from the standpoint of, of patient care, uh, but also from an economic standpoint, the value in such technologies. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if the U.S. pivotal trial is successful, mm -hmm. essentially replicating the observations in the study presented here at the American Heart Association meeting, you know, we would expect to get FDA approval and make this available. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's enough evidence for early adopters to want to use this and explore its use and, and uh, get some experience with it. But beyond that, uh, you know, we certainly have in mind doing additional trials, including randomized controlled trials, mm -hmm. to continue to demonstrate uh, the value proposition. So for the pivotal trial, is it will it just be a test population or does it need a similar derivation population as well compared to what's being presented today? Yeah, so in the pivotal trial, we're looking at a test population uh, and uh, you know, have, have goals similar to that demonstrated in this study. Excellent. Yeah. Dr. Abraham, is there anything else you'd want to tell the audience about the study or anything that you wanted to highlight? 
No, I, I, you know, I would simply conclude by saying I'm incredibly excited about this technology. I think this is the perfect marriage between clinical observation and uh, artificial intelligence. Should be a, a great help to both patients and to clinicians, but it'll always require some clinical judgment here in knowing what to do with the information. Yeah. Congratulations to you, the rest of the investigators, and uh, really excited to see what happens next. Thank you so much. Yeah.